Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 8-Bit Adventures podcast. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest geeky news of the week. I am your host, Sean Hayes, and this is episode 291 of the 8-Bit Adventures podcast. Um, so apologize if I sound awful. Uh, I'm feeling a little under the weather, uh, which is, uh, and, and the weather is not great out right now anyway. Um, so if I sound a little, a little husky, uh, that, that's why I'm just, just fighting some seasonal cold type stuff. Uh, not COVID thankfully, <clears throat> but, uh, I, I may need to use, uh, the, the mute button a bit, uh, during during this episode so i uh, hope everyone's doing well um there was you know a couple, couple news items out this week there was a lot more like magic the gathering news than video game news it seems like a lot of the big stuff was last week like last week with the you know microsoft activision deal and things like that um but we've got some we've got some stuff in here so uh yeah, why don't we get right into it? Let let you know instead of listening to me talk. Let's get right into this week's news. Uh so first up, uh, The Verge reports that roughly fifty percent of staff at the indie music platform Bandcamp were effectively laid off as part of the company's sale to Song Trader. Um, so Bandcamp was formerly owned by Epic uh, and then sold to Song Trader as Epic having some sort of a downturn. Uh, I'm sure there are various lawsuits and and cases like with Apple, say. Uh, didn't have anything to do with it. Um, but uh, yeah, so Bandcamp was sold to Song Trader as part of that. Um, divestiture. Uh, Song Trader has not voluntarily uh, recognized Bandcamp's unionization efforts at the time of recording. Uh, employees who were not extended offers from Song Trader uh, will be eligible for severance, according to uh, a statement by Epic. Um, so it's not that they were they were like explicitly laid off. It's just that when Song Trader bought Bandcamp. They only extended job offers to about 50% of the staff. Uh, this is, of course, in light of, uh, I think a few weeks ago, Epic laid off uh, uh, like 18% of its workforce, which amounted to like 800 people. So, uh, yeah. Layoff's not great. Um, and, uh, and hopefully song trader will, you know, go along with, uh, the unionization efforts. So, and that hopefully, you know, again, I've been really hammering down this unionization point. Uh, it feels like over the past year, um, hopefully we see more and more both tech and games industry jobs go that route. I mean, if, if not all industries, but you know, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, best of luck to everybody that got laid off. You know, it's, it's not great. I've been there a few times myself. Um, and especially in this economy, it's not great. So, all right, next up, uh, the verge reports that Bethesda's head of publishing, Pete Hines, is retiring. Uh, Hines has been with Bethesda since 1999, when he joined as Senior Vice President of Global Marketing and Communications. Uh, he is best known uh, as sort of being the, the sort of public face for the Fallout series. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Definitely a veteran of the industry, been with Bethesda for 24 years. That's quite a long time. Um, and uh, he was, uh, he'd only been in the head of publishing role for a year. 
So he he took that 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 role last year. So I don't know. Maybe maybe after being being the head of it all, he he finally said, "I'm I'm good. I'm done." Uh. So yeah. Uh, not quite sure what this is gonna mean for Bethesda. Who's gonna who's gonna take up the mantle? Um. But uh, yeah, we'll have to see. Next up, uh, Polygon reports that uh, Darrington Press's Illuminated Worlds t- tabletop RPG, Candela Obscura, will be released on November 14th. Uh, the game features a Victorian Gothic horror setting uh, known as the Fairlands, and the players are members of a secret society uh, that investigates strange occurrences, dangerous magic, and sort of otherworldly corruption that's bleeding into our world. Uh, Darrington Press's parent company, Critical Role, uh, has both a how-to play video um, and an actual play series, uh, for those that are not aware of that, um, that that showcases how the game is played. Um, There are also quick start rules that are available uh, for free uh, from the Darrington Press website, I believe. Um, So it's like a quick um, PDF. Um, I did watch the how-to play video. Kind of seems similar to uh sort of uh in the same vein as like a powered by the apocalypse type game um where you have a role and that role has a specialty each one gives you special actions that you can take there are a bunch of base actions um unlike powered by the apocalypse is you build a dice pool of six-sided dice based on your rating um so in that respect it's a little bit like a a white wolf type game where you're like sort of like counting up how many how many dice you have um and then uh you also have points in various uh actions um so like you don't have stats like you do in white wolf uh or in powered by the apocalypse it's uh you kind of just put points into specific actions that you take uh, and that determines how many dice you roll, and then it's the result of the dice which determines whether it's or the result of the die of your choice that determines uh, success or or failure. Um, and uh, I mean, as a, there's there's like uh, spendable points that you can have in various actions. Um, you can spend those to get more dice for a particular dice pool. Uh, and if you have like a little check mark next to a given action, um, one of your dice becomes gilded, quote unquote, which just means it's just a special D6. Uh, where if you pick that result, um, you get a you get a point back in that action. Um, so that's a little interesting, uh, you know. And then they have sort of a a three strikes uh method for uh sort of taking i don't want to say damage but like uh injuries i guess um so like you can you can get sort of hit three times with a various effect and a various thing um like body mind magic uh before you get a scar which then affects some of your actions uh, and then if you get three scars and you would get another one, you're you're out. You're permanently incapacitated in some way. So uh, the the book will have two versions, a standard hardcover for forty dollars and a limited edition hardcover for sixty dollars. The limited edition will have sort of a faux leather finish uh, with some embossing and uh She's drawing a blank on the on the term for it, but basically some like inlay on it um, to sort of give it like a a sort of gilded look to it. Um, so yeah, November fourteenth for that for folks who are looking for you know a bit more of an investigative uh, style of play. Um, but again, like if you've played a uh, powered by the apocalypse game, you can you can look at that 
and then sort of be like, okay, you know, I, I see this. Yeah. Like I can see inspirations from that style of play. So. Next up, IGN reports uh, that some of the cards and mechanics from the upcoming upcoming Fallout Commander decks for Magic the Gathering were revealed. Uh, the four decks, um, so it'll be a four deck set uh, similar to previous, previous Universes Beyond Commander sets uh, like Warhammer, 40k, uh, uh, Doctor Who, uh, the Lord of the Rings decks. Um, but the four decks uh, will be the following. Um, so the first will feature dog meat uh, from. I don't know. I'm not super familiar with Fallout, so please forgive me. Uh, uh, um, I think dog meat was in the one that featured Boston. I don't remember what it was called. Um, but uh, dog meat will be a, a Naya deck, um, which is red, green and white uh, revolving around auras, equipment and junk tokens. Um. So look at like dog meat basically has an ability where you you send him out and then he goes and brings stuff back to you, um, which I, I thought was funny. Uh, Caesar Legion's Emperor in a Mardu deck. So red, white and black uh, revolving around token generation, namely sacrificing creatures to generate either soldier tokens or dealing damage based on tokens. Um Dr. Madison Lee in a Jeskai deck, so red, white, and blue. Very, very thematic. Uh, focusing on energy counters and doing stuff with energy counters. So, been a while since we've seen energy counters in Magic the Gathering, but uh, folks who are uh, a fan of that mechanic will be overjoyed with this deck. Uh, and then uh, the Wise Mothman uh, in a Soul Tie, so which is green, black, and blue. Uh, mutant deck that that goal seems to be to proliferate uh, rad counters. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to go over like what junk tokens and rad counters are. Uh, so junk tokens um, from the from the dog meat deck. Um, and I think they show up elsewhere, too, are um, it's an artifact token that lets you tap and sacrifice it to exile the top card of your library uh, as a sorcery. Um, and then you can play that card, uh, you know, until the end of your turn. So, um, very, very red flavored mechanic. Um, and then for, uh, the rad counters. So there's like a radiation emblem helper card. I don't really know what it counts as, uh, that basically gives you the rules for rad counters. So if you have any rad counters, at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you mill that many cards, and then you lose one life and a rad counter for each non-land card you mill. Okay? Uh, so for those who don't know uh, anything about magic uh, and are just like, what, what the, why is he speaking in tongues? Um, so... Basically, uh, uh, in Magic, you have a combat phase, and then before and after that, you have a phase in which, like, you get to play cards. Um, so that's that's your pre-combat main phase. Um, so at the start of that, if you have any rad counters, you take that many cards off the top of your deck, you discard them, and then any cards that aren't land cards, you get rid of a rad counter that you have and you lose one life. So, uh, I think this is an interesting sort of take on it. I, you know, I, I was kind of thinking that it might've just been an infect mechanic, uh, but I know everybody hates poison counters. So I think this is an interesting way of introducing like a poison like mechanic without it being oppressive like uh poison counters are um because with poison counters if you accumulate 10 you just lose uh so yeah i think it's an interesting mechanic i don't know how great it will be uh in play um generally forcing opponents to mill cards 
is a risky strategy uh because if you're playing against a deck that like uh like a reanimator archetype where you take cards from your discard pile and you put them directly into play uh usually for a cheaper cost than just playing the card um you know not great to just put cards into their graveyard um you know i know there's a uh commander from the D set uh which would love getting rad counters um because that means they get to just run into dungeons all the time uh so we'll have to see. But um, I wanted to particularly note uh, three cards that are going to be in this that were revealed. Um, so two of them are new and one of them is not. So the one that's not is Crucible of Worlds. Uh, it's a really good card um, in certain deck archetypes, which is you can play lands from your graveyard. So. Uh, yeah, this combined with rad counters means that like you put all those lands in your graveyard and now you can just play them. Instead of, you know, having to do some sort of recursion. Um, so that's great. I'm sure, you know, reprint for that will be nice. Um, and then the two new cards, uh, Rad Storm, which I'm sure will be in the Wise Mothman deck. Um, so for three colorless and a blue, it's an instant, and it just has two words on it. Storm and Proliferate. Uh, storm, very divisive mechanic. Uh, kind of surprised that they put it in. Uh, but, uh, so Storm is basically for each other spell that you cast that turn, you copy this spell. Um, Proliferate is, uh, you know, for everything in play, including players, uh, that have a counter of some sort, you may put another one of those counters on it. Uh, you know, like say rad counters, um, and that's it. That's the card. So I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, I could see that becoming, you know, a decent option for uh poison deck. You know, it, you know, proliferate decks that were already in existence that were running poison that had blue. Uh, you know, I could see it in some sort of uh, you know, simic, uh, plus one plus one counter decks. Um, so yeah, it's, it, storms are really, it's, a, it's a busted mechanic. Uh, so, um, and I, and I think the fact that it's just proliferate, you know, and it costs four, you know, I, I think this is going to be a great card, but, you know, I, I think it's also kind of some, some protections were put against it to make it not super broken. Um, that said, I think uh, once it hits, um, yeah, we're going to see all sorts of nonsense with Poison, I think, for some sort of niche meme deck uh, with that. Um, all right, so Nuka-Cola Vending Machine is the last card that I wanted to highlight. Uh, this one, for food-based decks, this is bonkers. So it costs three. It's an artifact. You can pay one, tap it, create a food. Very standard, you know, great for food generation, easy peasy. Here's, here's where it gets bonkers, is whenever you sacrifice a food, create a tap treasure. Uh, so food in magic is you pay two, you sacrifice the food, you tap sacrifice the food, uh, and you gain three life. Um, not great in and of itself. Uh, but there are a lot of cards that synergize with having food or using food to do other things. Uh, treasure is you tap it and sacrifice it to add uh, a mana of any color. Um, treasure tokens, absolutely fantastic resource um, to have. Uh, and there's there's certain cards uh, that already have a lot of synergy with, like, in particular, food and treasure tokens. So the fact that it's whenever you're doing a thing, uh, and it's not necessarily that whenever you sacrifice a food to gain life, it's just whenever you sacrifice it. Um, so there are a number of deck archetypes that this will be fantastic in, um, especially for those that uh, got the uh, sort of hobbits of the food and fellowship uh, commander deck 
from Lord of the Rings. This will go great in it. Uh, super excited about that. You know, I'm I'm not. I don't think I'm gonna get any of these decks, but I might buy that as a single uh, card because it is it, that's awesome. <laughs> And uh, and then I can use it for my Hobbit deck to commit more war crimes. So, all right, that that covers that. Uh, in further Magic: The Gathering news, Polygon reports that Wizards of the Coast will be consolidating Magic: The Gathering draft boosters and set boosters into one product called Play Boosters in 2024. This change will begin with the Murders at Karlov Manor set. Uh, the price will match the cost of a set booster, which is the more expensive of the two, uh, and contain the following. So it'll have six slots for commons, one slot for either a common card or a card from the list, which is like a reprint. It's like a special reprint set list. I, I don't know. Um, Wizards maintains like a... a like, a, I guess a list, quote unquote, of uh, older cards that, like, they want to throw back into back into play. Um, so from that, two slots for uncommons, one slot for a rare or mythic rare, one slot for a basic land, one slot for a non-foil wild card, one slot for a foil wild card, and then one slot for, you know, your general junk stuff so an add a token a helper card or an art card um note that all of these uh in the in the document had um something noted as like uh, uh qualifies for booster fun which um i don't know if that means like alt art treatment or something uh it was noted that um a pack can have up to Four rare slash mythics in it. So, uh, Wizards is hoping this will reduce the burden of carrying multiple SKUs on local game stores. So, uh, that was a common complaint is that, you know, if like set boosters sold a lot better, um, cause set boosters were more geared towards collectors and people who weren't playing limited. Uh, so people like people who playing commander, um, um, you know, and const like whatever constructed formats, uh, that people are still playing, like maybe modern pioneer, uh, whereas draft boosters were just for people playing like draft or sealed, um, which you know tended to be, at least around here, the bigger tournament presence, uh, but you know if you wanted to just go in to the store and just buy booster packs. Uh, generally, you were looking at buying uh, set boosters and not draft boosters. Um, long time players, such as myself, uh, will know that the game has only had like two different kinds of boosters uh, for only a few years. So like back when I first started playing, there was just booster packs. So the fact that like there's been draft boosters and set boosters has been very confusing for me. Uh, so the fact that they're going to consolidate them, um, you know, the higher price point, uh, I think set boosters are a dollar more a pack, maybe $2 more a pack. So, you know, the price of playing in limited will go up, um, how much it goes up, whether it's just a nominal amount or a significant amount may depend on the store. Um. But I, I know for a fact that uh, one of our local stores, um, at least, uh, so so Purple Dragon before it closed, um, you know, the owner, uh, Nico, had mentioned draft boosters uh, had a very difficult time trying to gauge how many to buy because uh, outside of using them to run tournaments, like they never sold. Um, whereas set boosters consistently, very consistently sold. And so it was much easier to gauge, to gauge that. So 
I also think consolidating SKUs is good. You know, don't don't make things super complicated for customers. Um, you know, obviously, you know, increase in price hikes not great for consumers. But you know, we'll we'll have to see if this ends up being a net positive or not. Um, I think one of the justifications that Wizards has was because there's going to be more stuff in there uh than they were for draft boosters and you're going to get more value out of it that it'll be worth the extra cost we'll see i mean they say that but at the same time there's a lot of garbage rares so you know uh yeah we'll we'll have to see if this ends up being a net positive but uh you know price increase aside which, uh, to be clear, it's technically only a price increase if you are looking at it from a limited perspective. Um, if you are like me, you know, and you kind of just only play Commander at this point. Like, I, I did one draft for, like, the Lord of the Rings, or one sealed uh, event for Lord of the Rings. And I haven't since then, um, just because, you know, it's it's quite different from you know, spending some money here and there to augment commander decks. And then it is to like every week show up and pay like $35 to do a uh, draft tournament. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're coming from my perspective, then the price hasn't gone up and now it just means there's a consolidated product. Um, so I guess in my case, it's a positive, but understandably, if you're someone that regularly plays limited, uh, you know, prices going up is not great. You know, we, we've certainly had enough of that for everything across the board uh, since the pandemic. So we'll have to see. Uh, but yeah, so um, so whenever Murders, of Carlo- Murders at Karloff Manor comes out in 2024 is when we'll see this changeover. Next up, Polygon reports that the Van Gogh Museum will no longer offer a special Pikachu promo that ties in with its Pokemon exhibit uh, due to safety concerns. So, uh, so yeah, they're doing a special, it's like a Pokemon exhibit um, where it has like Van Gogh pieces recreated uh, with like Pokemon either in them adjacent um, sort of a thing. Neat exhibit idea. Uh, and, and glad that like, like fine arts museums are kind of meshing with pop culture like this. Um, but uh, yeah, Pokemon, Pokemon kind of shook it. Like for those who have been like absolutely distraught over the lack of product for Lorcana. Like, this is what happens when you take that level of demand and you you scale it up, like, uh, uh, to a thousand. Because, uh, like, people, and the, and the weird thing is, like, most people don't even play Pokemon. Uh, the, the trading card game. Like, it's all collectors. Uh, so basically, uh, scalpers and, and, like, diehard fans ransacked the gift shop uh and and i i watched a video clip of it and it was absolute madness like i i cannot even it was people absolutely jam-packed in there it's in like a museum gift shop okay not very big not exactly designed to you know have like hordes of people descend upon it so uh it was just like people absolutely stuffed in there like climbing over each other to get like prints promo cards you know this promo card and and things like that it's like come on and the only thing i could think of is when you hear about you know the stereotypical like black friday walmart doorbuster sale where employees get trampled and crushed that is what this looked like And again, at a fine arts museum. 
So the museum said the card will be made available for purchase at the Pokemon Center online store in the near future. And also at participating Dutch retailers. Um, but will never again be available at the museum. Understandably, they were like, we do not want this. Like, this is a safety concern. Like, we are not equipped for this. No, we're not doing this. Uh, and, you know, it. I'm. I'm. I don't I'm I'm a little surprised that the Pokemon company hasn't kind of uh made a a bit of a stronger statement about it. Uh cuz this does not reflect well on on the card game. Like it it looks bad when you have people sort of clamoring over uh a promo card like this. I mean, there was, it was absolute anarchy. Uh, so yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, embarrassing is, uh, one word I would describe, uh, as, as far as the behavior. So, uh, and also it. The the promo card is uh you know Pikachu with a gray hat. And here's the thing. It was people getting it to then resell it. You know, for for thousands of dollars. Again, for cardboard folks. Uh so yeah. And that's the thing, you know, for people who are then not going to play the game. So just just let that sink in for a little bit. Uh and and then we're going to move on to our to our next topic. It's a little bit of a palate cleanser. We're going to move on to our next topic. Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Uh Mario's next adventure is now out. You can buy it. It's available. Uh uh looks like pretty widely uh, reviewing very well. Um, I don't think this comes as a surprise to anybody. Uh, but I just have a, a couple couple of notes here. Um, so uh, Ars Technica uh, notes the game is like quote. Somebody at Nintendo asked, "What if we made a game where every level was like uh, the infamous Super Mario World Two Yoshi's Island level? Touch fuzzy, get dizzy." Uh, and that's. That is wild that we went from, so like that level came out, uh, you know, back when Super Mario World 2 was released, uh, and, and the idea behind that level is like, it's kind of a normal platforming level and everything, and it's like very early in the game, and, uh, there are these like, like puff-like creatures that float around, uh, and if you touch one, uh, you know, it doesn't deal damage to you. It doesn't cause you to lose baby Mario or anything. It just, it, it makes everything trippy. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, censorship groups were, were like, uh, this is, this is a very clearly coded, uh, sort of hallucinogenic, uh, thing here. Uh, this ain't great. And so Nintendo, like in future iterations has like scaled it back. Uh, so for them to do a whole game, that sort of, you know, not quite like psychedelic, uh, but just on that level of weird things are happening is fantastic. It's great. Uh, um, I also read some reviews from uh, Game Informer and IGN, both reviewed very well, um, praising the creative wonder effects that just like completely changed the gameplay on its head. Uh, you know, things like a very nominal ways of you know, it might change like the the way in which you play through the level. So instead of being like scrolling to the right, it might like scroll in a different direction. Uh, you know, obviously we saw in the trailers and stuff like the the weird bendy caterpillar pipes and things like that. You know, just elephant, the elephant power up. Uh, but also the badges. So there are like unlockable and equipable badges that 
when you equip it, like gives you a new gameplay mechanic. So things like a crouch jump or there's apparently like a, a piranha plant grappling hook type thing to let you climb, like stick to walls. So like, like Mario gets a hook shot. Uh, uh, there's some item which lets you change your, tr change the trajectory of your jumps mid air. Um, so that all, like, that sounds great. And that sounds exactly like what you would include, like in a Mario game to keep freshening things up. Um, so I haven't played it myself yet. Um, budgets are a little tight. Uh, I can't really, can't really justify, um, the $60 price tag at the moment. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it. So my hope is maybe holiday season, someone picks it up for me for Christmas, maybe. Uh, but I'm very excited for it. I, you know, I love Mario games, uh, Mario platformers in particular. And uh, I, I'm glad to see that this one is reviewing pretty well. Um, so, yeah, hope uh, hope those of you out there uh, who are interested in it, get your hands on it and uh, give it a play. Let me know. Let me know how it goes. You know, I, I love to hear people, uh, especially if, if they're excited about something, you know, if they're excited about uh, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. So um, one criticism is online co-op play is a bit limited so if you want to do some like actual co-op play you got to do couch co-op um this is probably not a shock to anybody who's been following nintendo for for a number of years but um yeah i mean couch co-op is is how you kind of have to do nintendo co-op multiplayer so uh because it, it's like pretty limited online so, all right, that is going to wrap things up for this week. Thank you all for joining me. Um, if you want to see more stuff from 8-Bit Adventures, check out 8bitadventures.com. Um, if you want to help support that content, uh, you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash 8bitadventures. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. And uh, that, that helps out sort of all of the facets of 8-Bit um, Adventures from like the podcast to the comics streams and all that stuff um and and that is the best way to support uh uh these endeavors um big shout out and thank you to all of the current patrons out there uh thank you for your continued support um and uh the opening theme to this podcast is one up by professor shy guy you can find his work over at professor shy guy dot bandcamp dot com so with that hope you all have uh, a wonderful week and as always, have fun, happy gaming, and enjoy your pie cake.